Thank you, Sharon. Hello, everybody. Happy to be here with you. I'm going to get my screen up and hopefully you're going to be seeing that soon. Let's see. There we go. Is that all good, Sharon? Looks great, Judy. Uh, and okay. oh, Judy, also I should just mention everybody, if you want to put your name in the chat box and where you're from, that would be great. Yeah, that's terrific. And please do use the Q&A. Uh, take, I'll take questions as we're going through the, uh, the presentation and at the end as well. Uh, you see up on the screen my email address. Uh, if you've ever been on a presentation with me, you know that I tend to produce a lot of content and, um, and I'll want you to be able to reach out to me if there are things you want to talk about later. So uh, you can always find me there. So I do work for CLASP. CLASP is a national nonprofit that advocates for policies and practices that benefit low-income people. And in this presentation, I'm really going to uh, explore with you what adult education programs and services look like across different settings and how the governance and geography and economies and focused populations are really reflected in those service strategies. And then we'll also look at a few of the um, new innovations I've been seeing pop up. So uh, as Sharon said, I've been in the adult ed field for more than 30 years, first working locally and then at the state and, and now in this national policy advocacy role. If you were at, the, at that first uh, Manager Monday webinar with Erin Roth, the acting Deputy Secretary of Labor for Maryland, she did a great uh, job discussing the opportunities inside the Federal Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And I'm gonna double down on a few of those levers in the federal legislation that really exist to build equity in local communities. And then I'm gonna share some information about state adult education systems, both the way that the federal funds are governed by different systems in different states and then the way state investments in adult education either complement or perhaps work separately from the federal investments and, and the resulting differences. But honestly, each state is different, right, because of different choices that are made at the state level. So I'll, I'll only be able to kind of scratch the surface here. And then, of course, uh, the local level brings even more diversity of funding, more diversity of service models. And I'm going to highlight a few of the many, many wonderful models of local programming with an emphasis on programs that are, are braiding funds and operating uh, perhaps with federal, state, and local funds and uh, provide again those newer models that hopefully will just kind of give you a big picture of adult ed as a whole. But first we're just going to go way back in time. Uh, the federal investment in adult education started uh, about the same time I did um, in the 60s. It was one of a number of war on poverty initiatives. Uh, the investment spurred a research agenda. We got things like adult learning theory and functional context education, that precursor to integrated education and training that we have now. And those things led to the National Workplace Literacy Program. And then in uh, 1991, we had the National Literacy Act. It was signed by H.W. Bush. Uh, it was about preparing America for the year 2000. And I believe it was really a part of Barbara Bush's legacy as a major proponent of, of literacy and literacy programs. In 1998, we had the Workforce Investment Act. This is what really made adult education part of a larger effort, right? It introduced the idea of AFLA, of Title II, of WIA as being part of a one-stop system. WIA really sought to create this federal state local partnership for delivering adult ed through the one-stop centers. And in some places in the country, uh, this co-location strategy took root. But for many of us uh, who were out in the states at that time, our attention in WIA really focused on the new requirements for standardized testing and the other sort of innovations that were baked into the law. The beginning of the 21st century is when we had a great deal of philanthropic investment in adult career pathway work. 2010, uh, we had Assistant Secretary of Ed Brenda Dan Messier, who herself is an adult educator, uh, release guidance on integrated education and training to support efforts like IBEST that was happening in Washington State and the many other integrated education and training models that were popping up through Bridges to Opportunity and Accelerating Opportunities and Shifting Gears. And all during WIA, what we were learning, what we were doing out there in practice was being fed up to policymakers by organizations like, like the one I'm at now, CLASP and like COE and other advocacy organizations. 
So that when, uh, in 2014, when WIOA passed, it contained new definitions of service models and really this host of alignment opportunity. And we got regulatory language for the very first time. So I want to emphasize, again, you'll hear me say this a lot, that the changes that happened from WIA to WIOA, many of those things that Aaron highlighted last week, are there because of the work that people were doing in the states during the early 2000s. You know, the beginning of the 21st century just brought a whole lot of education innovation conversation. Think about how high school reforms introduced dual enrollment and college and career readiness. And the same idea, the same focus was being seeded in a lot of places by philanthropic investments in adult education. So in the Midwest where I was working, the Joyce Foundation funded uh, Shifting Gears. This was our Minnesota fast track model that was initiated under Shifting Gears, which was really about building institutional relationships between adult ed and post-secondary ed and workforce development and human service partners. So you can see that we tried to imagine the spectrum of adult education from from really a bridge prep model where we're just starting to intentionally focus on, on embedding work uh, concepts in adult ed uh, up to that recognized post-secondary credential through integrated instruction with the support of human services, CBOs, workforce development partners. Um, this was really uh, the, the beginning of sort of a, a co-enrollment conversation. Uh, one of our partner states was Wisconsin, and this is the Wisconsin RISE model, which did a really nice job of also uh, showing how this education uh, pathway was connected to an employment pathway. Again, the idea of uh, continuously um, building skills, regardless of where somebody started in the path. And uh, the U.S. Department of uh, Education, Office of Career Technical Education, borrowed Wisconsin's graphic in, in a lot of ways to create this image, this sort of mega image tying together uh, Perkins programs of study, that high school to post-secondary dual enrollment model, and the on-ramps for adults through co-enrollment, through integrated instruction, and really a partnership with workforce development to ensure that education and training had value in uh, local economies. So I like to think of this visual as sort of the community-wide career pathway model. But we didn't call it career pathway necessarily when we started. Uh, we just ended there. And we all have really helped introduce the policy that could help us see how doing that co-enrollment and that leveraged investment uh, could help us scale and sustain our work. So I'm going to spend a few minutes looking at how the federal investment in adult education which is the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, expanded our purpose, uh, introduced some new definitions for uh, popul target populations, new definitions of service models, and gave us uh, the shared performance measures with our other core WIOA partners. So here's a term you've heard me say a couple times now, and maybe you know it and maybe you don't, but AFLA, AFLA. So AFLA is the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act. It is WIOA Title II. Uh, it is the federal investment in adult education. And under WIOA, no purposes of adult ed, no purposes of AFLA were deleted, but a few more were added. So AFLA is still, just as it was under WIA, it's still about this partnership, this partnership between the federal government, state government, and locals to provide adult education and literacy for uh, a, a number of purposes. This first purpose is for, uh, for getting li gaining literacy, uh, getting the knowledge and skills that would uh, allow someone to have employment and economic self-sufficiency. Self Another purpose, a second purpose, is really the purpose uh, that we think of in the family literacy part of AFLA. Uh, it really values the reasons that parents and family members come to our classes, really to become full partners in the educational development of their children and to build economic opportunities for their families. I think this is the purpose that um, that we tend to forget about when we think about uh, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, but it's totally a part of our mission, and I think it's uh, an important um, purpose for us to own and to bring to conversations with our workforce development partners. So important uh, to, to be supportive of uh, adults in their role in the family. 
The third purpose, uh, this one is about uh, that secondary school diploma, which has always been part of our work, but also includes now the idea of transition, transition to post-secondary education and training, and it includes the words career pathways. So again, all of that uh, uh, work on the ground that bubbled up into that octave visual of the of the career pathway the idea that high school completion is not a terminal goal the fourth purpose um, AFLA brought a change to a part of uh, adult ed's investment the federal investment in adult ed called the integrated English language and civics funds which used to be a separate grant fund and under uh, WIOA got rolled in under WIOA sometimes you'll hear people call this uh, section 243 WIOA section 243 which now puts the the adult uh, or the integrated deal civics as part of AFLA's purpose this idea of helping immigrants and ELL uh, English language learners improve their reading writing speaking math but also acquire an understanding of the American system of government responsibilities of citizenship so those are all the the four purposes of AFLA the law as a whole we owe as a whole so not just the AFLA part not just the title to adult ed part but uh, the overarching purpose of the law for both uh, our system and for our core partners in Title I, Adult Youth Dislocated Worker, Title III, Employment Services, Title IV, Vocational Rehabilitation Services, right, all the core titles under WIOA. There are a number of purposes there, but this is the first one. Uh, and, it, and it is new language. It is new language about uh, the purpose of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is to help people in the United States, uh, particularly people, individuals with barriers to employment, get access to and opportunities to succeed in employment education training uh, and have the support services they need. So this idea of individuals with barriers to employment, I think is such an important concept for us to understand in the adult ed space um, because um, we all contains definitions for all these different populations and I'll just leave this slide up here for a few seconds for you to scan through these columns because this should feel very familiar they, I, I think these population descriptors really do describe the people that we serve in adult education programs um, in fact, everyone you serve fits into at least one category, which is uh, up here, the top of the third column, individuals who have low levels of literacy. So in the federal reporting, if you're operating inside the federal uh, WIOA adult education system, you are reporting on the number of people you serve under these categories. But you and your core partners, everybody under WIOA is, is reporting on that. And these are to be cumulative in other words if you serve a hundred people uh, you might be turning in 300 uh, individual with barrier um, reports on your reporting because uh, an individual may have more than one barrier right so this federal reporting includes reporting people served with these characteristics as well as race, race and ethnicity and again the idea is that a federal investment in education is about equity. It's really about driving services to the people who need them the most. Career pathway. So career pathway is one of the definitions we got under WIO, and you've probably seen this many times, um, and yet it still remains a, 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 a a uh, point of confusion in a lot of partnership meetings uh, there is this definition this definition is now in three federal laws it just showed up in the Perkins 5 legislation um, and it's a solid definition but most like most of uh, legal language it's probably got you know twice as many words as it needs um, an important word here between part F and part G is the word and this word and at the end of part F tells you that all of these seven um, elements need to be included to to meet the definition of the rigorous high quality education training and other services but I would also argue that if you just keep these four concepts in your mind um, these seven parts are can be sort of distilled down to these four ideas because part A and part G 
just basically say that this education and training has to have labor market value. It needs to uh, result in something that, that helps a person succeed in the, in the labor market. Uh, part B and F talk about requiring secondary and post-secondary credentials, paying attention to someone's need to complete a high school completion or gain English language learning skills, uh, and get a post-secondary credential. So uh, it, it is um, differentiating career pathway from short-term training uh, that does not pay attention to helping people continue to move forward educationally. Part C is uh, what I, a lot of people in the country call workforce navigators. It's the career and academic counseling that helps people succeed. And then D and E, sort of the meat of the service delivery for adult education is this integrated design and delivery. Um, this I would argue, and uh, again, I have argued this a lot, uh, is integrated education and training, right? Which is another service delivery model that we, uh, uh, had show up uh, defined in the federal law under WIOA, so it is now required in part of the WIOA funding in the 243 funding that, uh, that educators work on this three-part service delivery model that combines adult ed, workforce preparation, and workforce training. And just for your reference, I give you this slide, which has all three definitions from the federal law. Obviously, adult ed and literacy, we're, we're uh, familiar with that. Workforce training, I would point out the blue box on the bottom. Uh, that didn't change a great deal from WIA to WIO. It's very familiar to us. It's you know, occupational skill training, like um, career tech ed. It's also on the job training. It's also, if you look at part X down there, it's also adult ed and literacy, as long as they are done in combination with uh, the uh, one of the um, items from the list above. Workforce preparation, that box in the middle, a new definition, I think a very, um, again, excellent way of calling out what a lot of people in uh, adult ed uh, practice have known for a while, is that we really need to help people with their digital literacy skills, with uh, what a lot of people call executive function skills, self-management skills, uh, teamwork, understanding systems. These are all critical pieces for uh, IET. And finally, um, performance. So uh, a lot of that early work in adult education career pathways uh, was uh, lifting up how hard it was to partner across systems, to work with our workforce development system uh, partners when we all had different performance measures. But under the federal adult education system, right, all of the core WIOA partners, and then you see those listed across that top uh, row, uh, including us, Title II Adult Ed, but also our Title I Adult Dislocated Worker and Youth Partners, our Title IV Rehab Service Partners, our Title III Wagner Pizer. Um, well, Wagner Pizer has a couple of NAs in their, in their column, but the rest of us share these seven or six performance measures that are going to be reported, eventually reported up into one uh, report card, if you would, to the federal agencies uh, to gauge state performance. And this is the way that I like to think about these performance measures. So this is just another visual, uh, a way of visualizing. Um, you know, at Adult Ed, we've lived on the left-hand side of that exit line for a very long time. We've lived in the uh, the world of education function level gain. Uh, in WIO, it's called the measurable skill gain. Uh, so things like pre-post-test on a TABE or CASAS, um, getting that high school diploma, but there are other ways here. I like to think about this as sort of the multiple measures way of, of showing, demonstrating progress. So there are a number of ways to do that. And those are now open to all of our core partners. So it's not just adult ed who has that. Our Title I adult partners, our Title I dislocated worker partners have this way of showing progress too. So you can see the idea of, of working together, of doing co-enrollment uh, is much easier when uh, we're not just all living on, or half of us are living on the right side of the line, which are the exit measures. We all live together in all of these measures now. And uh, over there on the right side, you see credential outcomes and also labor market outcomes. And the thing I really wanna point out here, under the federal system, the labor market outcomes from WIA to WIOA have changed. 
they are not placement and retention. Um, and I know that a lot of people still use those terms and a lot of our workforce partners still use those terms, but think about the difference it makes if you think about designing your adult education, workforce development service strategy, not about helping someone get a job and then keep that same job, but instead designing your strategy so that when someone leaves you, they've exited from you, they're not coming back to your program, that you can look back into data and say, uh, I've helped that person. That person has succeeded. They've, they are employed. They're employed a year after they leave me um, and, uh, and they're employed at a job that, where they're making some, some money. And, and honestly, most adult education students are working, so we're not going to have trouble with those, with those metrics. Uh, is my my opinion. Uh, okay, so a couple more things on WIOA, and then we'll talk about the states. Um, WIOA co-enrollment, WIOA does require reporting co-enrollment between all the core partners. So again, here's my list of the WIOA core partners. Co-enrollment is, is defined as concurrent enrollment um, by an eligible individual in two or more of the six core programs administered by the Act. Uh, and the uh, federal guidance has said uh, this about co-enrollment. By emphasizing co-enrollment at the federal, state, and local levels, the workforce system will be able to better develop an understanding of which programs are necessary for participant success and advancement toward their career and educational goals. So that feels a bit like <laughs> like being graded on on what what is most important and as a result uh, consequently some states uh, have really reached out to the federal um, Department of Labor and, and the Department of Education um, to to get some guidance about um, when I'm when you're co-enrolling participants how do you track their performance how do you report their outcomes uh, the departments formed a cohort and seven different states representing uh, with state teams representing workforce and adult ed and uh, vocational rehabilitation and other partnership agencies put together state plans and are starting to operationalize some of those plans. Um, California's got a really strong plan that you can uh, go and look at if you're interested. Um, but by and large, what you're hearing across the country when people are thinking about co-enrollment, um, you know, co-enrollment's hard, partnership is hard. Um, is is why should we go through all this effort uh, uh, to have my system have to give credit to another system? Uh, you know, how, who takes credit? Who takes credit when uh, we've partnered together on this co enrollment? Um, and uh, luckily, there is some uh, lovely guidance. Um, oh, in the notes, I've got the link. I'll put the link on this slide as well so that you can all have a link to this federal guidance, uh, this federal webinar uh, that uh, spelled out quite clear that when you have co-enrollment, all programs can receive credit for the positive outcomes. It doesn't matter who's funding which particular part of the program. All programs uh, that assist a participant in attaining their employment, a credential, or measurable skills would take credit. So that's very um, uh, helpful in conversations about uh, that co-enrollment strategy. Uh, Couple more things, uh, the, the AFLA appropriations, just to quickly show you some numbers. Uh, these are from 2017, they come from a fact sheet. There are some excellent links that you received when you uh, signed up for this webinar and they're also on the slide from the uh, US Department of Ed, um, Office of Career Technical and Adult Ed. You can see that when Congress appropriates funds for AFLA, a small portion uh, of that fund uh, goes to the National Literacy leadership, national leadership activities. That includes things like research and evaluation studies and, and demonstration programs. We all uh, really uh, actually now specifically calls for an evaluation of the effectiveness of adult education and that uh, that evaluation study is being scoped right now. So that's that'll be interesting to watch. Uh, the remaining funds go out to the states. Those are called basic grants, and uh, these are funds to provide educational opportunities below the post-secondary level for adults over the age of 16 who are not currently enrolled in school, uh, lack a high school diploma, or lack the basic skills to function effectively in the workplace or in their daily lives. So once those funds go out, those basic grants go out to the states, um, they, they go, uh, the state gets to designate the lead WIOA Title II agency. 
So these vary, and if you look at uh, the screen here, you'll see the color on the map um, indicate the type of state agency. So the yellow states like Texas and uh, South Dakota, those have got their, we owe a Title II operating out of their Department of Labor. Uh, blue states, which are the majority, uh, as of the time this graphic was made in 2017, 29 uh, state education agencies. Um, but you also see green for uh, community colleges or even some red for technical and adult ed workforce state agencies. Those funds um, talk about the amount of service. So you can see in this pie chart uh, that uh, service between English language learners, English language acquisition, and adult basic ed is pretty split. Uh, and then adult secondary ed, sort of the higher level, uh, is, is the only 12% of the service. You can also see that the total expenditure, right, the federal to non-federal, non-federal is more than twice what the federal expenditure was in, in this, um, in that program year. So those federal funds, when they go to the states, uh, the states then have to run a competition to award the funds, right? So in Texas, for instance, this is the Texas Workforce Commission. Federal funds go to the Texas Workforce Commission and uh, the State Director of Adult Ed, Hanson Green, and his team, they offer, uh, they run a competition and uh, choose grantees, and then they offer a great deal of guidance and professional development to their grantees. So when a state, we owe a Title II agency like the Texas Workforce Commission, grants out the basic state grant funds, there's a long list of eligible providers who can receive these funds. Uh, so anything from a local education agency, right, like a, a, a K-12 school, a higher ed institution, a library, public housing, uh, and interestingly, I don't think I've ever seen this. So if somebody's on this webinar and you've seen a, an example of letter J, please let me know a partnership between an employer and an entity described in one of the paragraphs above. Um, so that's a, a really interesting uh, eligible uh, provider of adult ed uh, that I haven't seen happen in, a, in receiving a state grant. Um, in California, so let's look at a few other states. In California, the federal WIOA Title II funds go to the California Department of Education, about $90 million. And that's that top uh, image on this slide and that top uh, URL up on the orange bar. But then there's also a state investment, uh, more than $500 million annually, that's jointly governed by the California Department of Education and the California Community College Chancellor's Office under a program that had been known as AEBG. You can still see that, uh, that uh, acronym in the link, but now is called the California Adult Ed Program. And these state funds have got an added requirement of requiring a, a consortium model within a region. So if you receive uh, any of the sort of federal uh, funds that are around adult, about adult education, like we owe a Title II or Perkins Career Tech Ed, or uh, the TANF um, Employment Service Funds, or some local funds like jail education funds, then you are required to be around a table in crafting your region's strategic plan for adult education. So it's, it's got this very strong consortium model. Um, California also recently embarked on defining a set of immigrant integration metrics, because uh, when a state runs a, a a program using the federal money, they are allowed to create their own state metrics as well. Uh, so that's going to be an interesting uh, process to watch. If you visit that AEBG website at the link on the screen, you'll find a real uh, wealth of information about how this consortium model is resulting in student success. And they've uh, done a great job of taking the COABE Elevate, Educate and Elevate campaign and creating uh, student uh, success stories. So that's an example of a couple of states. There are other states like uh, the state of Nevada, for instance, that has a WIOA program, right? The federal money coming down in the basic state grant also has a state investment uh, in adult high school completion, but those two investments aren't uh, commingled. They don't run together. So there, you can find many different um, uh, versions of, of that uh, state 
uh, system. I also just want to note uh, the amazing work that happens in state correction education. Um, we owe a Title II funds can be used for correctional education and, and also states make their own investments through the Departments of Correction as well. Um, also federal financial aid uh, has been used. Uh, I think somebody, uh, yes, great, um, Merit has put in, a, in the Q&A talking about the Second Chance Act. Um, and we owe in the Prison Setting Second Chance Act right to bring down Pell Grants to be able to access um, uh, Higher Education Act Title IV dollars. So that's for post-secondary education. So in an integrated education and training model, you can see those funds being leveraged together, right? For Pell and we owe a Title II. Um, so I just put up an image here of, of CEA, CEA, the uh, Correctional Education Association, Association of State Correction education directors um, run these investments that really uh, create adult education programs for individuals inside uh, the state institutions. They really uh, do amazing work. Okay, now a few uh, of the local adult education examples. And again, so many, many uh, terrific uh, local applications of adult education. But I just want to um, show you a few that demonstrate the way models have developed to, to best serve their communities. So um, this is an example from a place called Summit Academy, which is an OIC. OICs are, um, gosh, I think it stands for Occupation and Industrial Centers. But anyway, an OIC is a career tech ed provider, a career technical education provider whose training programs are eligible for federal financial aid. And Summit is deeply embedded in a metro community there in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And they became aware that a great need for their community was a completion of a high school credential. There were people who were not able to enter their, um, their career tech ed programs because that lack of a high school uh, credential was a barrier to the training or to accessing the federal financial aid to pay for the training. So uh, Summit and, and leadership began a partnership with a local school district-based adult education program. They started this uh, GED Pathways program. I think they're now um, the number one uh, GED graduating um, the school in in Minneapolis that I think that's right they've also begun using the ability to benefit provision of the higher education title IV, allowing their adult education students to receive Pell Grants and work within a career pathway model that includes the secondary and post-secondary credential and then in another part of Minnesota, uh, far southwest, there's a, there's a different community with different needs. So while you look at this slide, uh, I'm going to read you a little bit from their executive summary, which, uh, which promoted this model to legislators, policymakers in the state, and um, it was really uh, rewarded. Uh, education has found itself in a stagnant state for several decades in rural Minnesota. This has perhaps been especially true in vocational or technical education. 2013, the governor issued a new mandate to public schools to create the world's best workforce. Using this mandate as motivation, individuals in Marshall, Minnesota blazed an innovative trail, creating a grassroots program called the Marshall Adult Youth Career Training. Uh, so I would really encourage you to go look at this model, which really, which leverages uh, a, a high school model uh, with a with an adult education model um, paying attention to the needs of local employers but also the um, the reality of resources in a rural area um, and if you look at the Southwest ABE uh, website in general you'll see a, a, a real spectrum of services they've created for their community it's really uh, it's impressive a new kind of adult education school that I see popping up in the Midwest is uh, the Excel Center, the Excel Adult High School Diploma uh, model. There are currently 14 locations in Indiana. Uh, these are Goodwill Industries standing up a model of high school completion for adults. Uh, we we'll see some other states, uh, the state of Maryland right now has an RFP out for adult, uh, alternative adult high school diploma models outside of the WIOA funds. So we're seeing um, different um, actors in this space. Uh, the, actually in Washington DC here, uh, there is now a, a, a 
an Excel um, adult high school model. And Washington DC has a really an entire ecosystem of adult education providers. Um, interestingly, the District of Columbia has authorized both early childhood education and adult basic education charter schools. So here's an example. This is the Berea uh, Public Charter School as an example of both in one. It is, it is this real two-generation solution to educating children and their adults in a bilingual format. Uh, I really encourage you to take a look at their model. It's, a, it's an amazing model. But DC also has uh, an amazing model of all volunteer-based adult education, the Washington English Center, uh, which has been around for over 25 years, provides daily classes in dozens of levels to hundreds of adults in the DC metro area. So again, uh, models um, evolving to serve their, uh, their target populations. Um, DC also has specific sector-focused adult ed, like uh, the tech-focused Bike Back School. So adult education manifests itself in, in many ways, utilizing many different funding streams uh, to meet the needs of the community. And I'd, I advise you to check any of these out and also send me examples of the work you're doing. I'd love to be able to promote um, the work of, of practitioners. Um, so these kind of creative models rely on multiple types of funding. Um, some of them might have formula funds, right? The kind of, this is the blue arrow on the left, the kind of institutional funds derived from federal or state funding. But uh, most adult education programs are also seeking competitive funds, those uh, grant funds. Uh, that's the orange arrow on the right. I was fortunate to be on a webinar recently with Mimi Daniels um, from the Minnesota Adult Career Pathway Office. So Mimi runs this shop that does competitive grants for adult education workforce development. And Mimi shared this graphic, which I, I thought really beautifully shows the interplay of the kind of formula WIOA type funds coupled with the additional resources, the competitive funds, the, the, uh, whether those are state or local or philanthropic that allow providers to, to form new partnerships and try new models and really innovate in the, in the adult ed space. Um, because, you know, honestly, the need is, is still so great. Um, and so I'm going to end here with a slide uh, to remind us all of, of PIAC, of the, um, the data set, the international study that revealed uh, really the great need in our communities, regardless of, of academic credential level, for foundational skill building. So, um, you know, your work uh, at, at whatever level, with whatever funds, uh, really builds up people's skills, builds communities. Um, so wherever you work within the sphere of adult education, I just want to remind you of how important you are. And with that, I uh, see if there are any questions that I can field. Uh, copies of the slides, copies of the PowerPoint, yes, they're probably already up on the website, and if not, they'll go out, I'm sure. Um, but Sharon, if you're listening, do let me add that link to that one slide because I want people to be able to access that. Um, and I think, Merritt, uh, you could let me know if there's anything else you'd like me to add about Second Chance Act, again, um, about um, uh, those are some of the resources that uh, that are coming out of Department of Labor. Oh, I think I said that wrong. Second Chance Act, Department of Labor funds, and the WIOA funds. The WIOA would be those formula funds, right? The Second Chance Act would be more of those discretionary um, competitive funds that uh, that allow people to innovate. Looking to see if I have any other questions. Catherine Paul says, thank you. Appreciate that. I know that it's a lot of information. Um, Melissa says on the CoAbe website. Um, Sharon, I'm forgetting. You usually send these as follow-ups in the email. Is that right? Right. So this okay. will come through Zoom, but then it's also going to be in the Adult Educators Repository, and it's also going to be in the archived portion of the website. So we have we archive all the webinars. It'll be there. It'll be on our Adult Educators Repository, and also come to you via Zoom. Perfect. Perfect. Any other questions? I'm doing that adult ed thing now where I'm just going to be quiet and see if anybody <laughs> <laughs> sit with silence for a minute. I could never make it a full minute. 
You see the question about the recording too? Uh, oh, that's right. I have to scroll down. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, recording of the video. Yes, you, you post that as well in the repository. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, I guess uh, you all can see on the screen where to find me and you know where to find these resources. And again, I'll say thank you for, uh, for all the work you do and um, hope to be in touch. Judy, this was so informative. Thank you so much for, for doing this webinar and thank you to all of our participants as well. So with that, we'll sign off.